Before memes, before the internet, before iPhones and mobile data, in a world where people were flipping their nut over the population burying their heads in newspapers. And in these newspapers, people were going crazy for these uh, printed sort of rage comics. But like before the internet, so they were on like, like paper and stuff. But no one, no one climbed to the top of the totem of these printed web comics more than my, my favourite fat ginger cat in the whole world, Garfield. You gotta understand, chaps. Garfield is an unmatched behemoth in the comic strip market. Garfield is the short form printed comics what Ray William Johnson was to YouTube back in 2013. And no one loves Garfield more than I. I've got I've got all the Garfield goodies. I'm, I'm committed. I, I got the phone. I got this plush I bought off Amazon for 30 quid that was described as giant but it doesn't look very giant to me. I love him. I, I got this Garfield t-shirt that says that says Spag Bowl. Garfield's favourite dish. I am a verified, certified Garfield enjoyer. So imagine my surprise when some bloke calling himself Godfield spews this iceberg tier list on Reddit and I know nothing about it. It made me question everything every facet of my personality. I tore down the posters that coated every inch of my wall and I punched a really big deep hole in it with just one punch which it was, it was quite impressive to be honest. Well actually if you saw how much I go to the gym and how much I can bench press it, it probably wouldn't be that much of a surprise. I crawled up in the fetal position and started weeping. That was until my mum came in and bought me one of those one of those little snacky trays with some grapes and crackers on it. Some, some, little, some little sweets and a little Nutella sandwich. And proposed instead of going absolutely bonkers, maybe I should do some research and maybe make a video on it. And I was like, get out of my room mum! Girl, this is my private space, but get out of my room. After she left, I thought that would actually be a pretty good idea. So I'm, I'm going to do it, but that's because it's my decision. Okay, mum. Tier 1 is like the idiot tier, the tier that any old normie Garfield fan will get a clean sweep on with ease. Me being who I am, I know everything on here like the back of my hands. Firstly, we got Garfield and Friends. This was the first Garfield TV show and is the Minecraft bedrock of Garfield. But who is Garfield and who are his friends? If you really have to ask that question, then you, you best just leave now. Otherwise, your incompetence is really going to cheese me off. For those real morons out there that don't know anything, the character of Garfield is a sardonic, dry-witted, grumpy cat. He's selfish, prone to to jealousy and is unappreciative of the people around him. He, he, he sounds a lot like Bill Murray, but he's not played by him yet. His owner is, is a bloke called John. He's a sensitive man and he just let, he lets Garfield walk all over him. Garfield mostly mocks John and is uninterested in his life and, and so are we and the majority of the people in his life. He's a fucking dork. If John was a vegetable, he'd be an unseasoned Swede. Garfield's next friend is Odie, who, who Garfield hates, so he's not really a friend. Garfield just kind of keeps him around for a bit of a laugh, I guess. Odie is a non-verbal dog who's just a, a, a big slobbering dummy. Garfield and Odie kind of have a Rick and Morty relationship. The genius and the idiot. It's a classic dynamic. You know it. Your dad knows it. The idiots you're friends with even know it. And that is that is all of Garfield's friends. I mean, he, he's for sure an introvert. Likes to keep a tight circle. Nothing wrong with that. I myself only have one friend, but we fell out over the fact he was always asking me for my wagon wheel when we were at school lunch. And I, I decided I'd had enough. My wagon wheels were worth more than our friendship. There are other cats that Garfield interacts with, but I, I, I'd be strained to call them friends. There's Nermal, who, who Garfield hates even more than Odie. Nermal is basically the scrappy do of the Garfield universe. Garfield's always trying to ship him off to like Abu Dhabi or somewhere, despite Nermal clearly being a child. Then we've got Arlene, the lady cat. Three pints. You know she's a lady cat because of those sensuous lips. She's barely in the TV show and is mostly seen in Garfield's fantasies and dreams. So yeah, you, you can't really call her a friend either. She's more of a distant, unattainable fantasy, much like you and ever finding love. Yeah, you. I'm talking to you through the screen. The reason the title is Garfield and Friends is because the show isn't actually 100% Garfield. We've also got some pigs and chickens and farm animals and shit here. This is US Acres, which is the next thing on the tier list. US Acres was, as far as I can tell, Jim Davies' only real other attempt to make a comic series. The only time he tried to write something other than Garfield. So US Acres is in the Garfield universe. Garfield, there is a un, there is a un, there is a universe to Garfield. What he came up with was Orson the Pig, whose alter ego is is a superhero called Power Pig. A duck called Wade. What what a, what a fucking shit name for a duck. No wonder this never took off as much as Garfield did. A rooster called Roy, which is what I consider to be an ex acceptable name for a cartoon rooster. Roy the Rooster, it has a ring to it. You can sell plushies with that name. And a sheep, a sheep called Lanolin. It's almost like he didn't want this one to take off. Who the fuck names their lovable cartoon sheep Lanolin? Why not, why not something like Barbara or something? That would have been great, because sheeps go bar. Think about the merchandising opportunities, Jim. Ain't no kid out there asking Father Christmas for a Lanolin sheep toy. I can't even spell Lanolin. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. There are some other characters in this, but who, who really cares, let's be honest. The comic strip was cancelled after three years and Jim Davies. Is it Jim Davies or Davies? Have I been saying his name wrong? Jim Davies. 
Davis. It's David. If, if I, I'm not changing it, I can't be asked. I, I, I'll just correct myself from now on. Well, the comic strip was cancelled after three years after Jim Davis sold US Acres to Viacom, taking it off the Garfield website forever. But he was never able to get rid of all the Rule 34 stuff, so the, the torch is still being carried. We, we don't got to worry. Next, we have the Garfield show, which added the third dimension to the Garfield verse, giving us beautifully animated CGI 3D Garfield. This show is like watching a cutscene for Garfield Cut, but where Garfield got out the cart and just started doing another Garfield show. It ran for five seasons, and I, I don't know what it is about this animation style that makes me feel so uncomfortable. Something is seriously wrong here. You can tell because I'm not eating. It looks and is written like it was made by one of them clever bot AIs. Right, now, now we've got the TV shows that any normie would know out of the way. If you've watched this far into the video, you'd probably be able to get into your, your run-of-the-mill local Garfield fan club without much hassle. But if you bust out these next little, little tidbits of the iceberg, you might be able to pull yourself a Garfield fangirl, which is, which is what this is all about, really. Big Titty Goff GF? Nah, I'll take the lazy lasagna Monday hating GF instead, please. Garfield Minus Garfield started as a Garfield fan's inside joke, where they take the original comics and remove Garfield from them. This made it look like Johnny's just an insane person who's talking to himself. Good for a chuckle, and Jim Davis seemed to think so too as he ended up making his own Garfield Minus Garfield strips in collaboration with the original inventor of the meme. To finish out tier one, we've got Garfield, his nine lives. The in fact false rumor of cats having nine lives can be traced all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. So I guess Jim Davis had a bit of a brainwave when he thought about the potential eight other lives of Garfield that could be explored. So he penned his magnum opus, a big comic book of Garfield's past, present and future. I, I decided to have a read through it and was immediately greeted with this horrific depiction of gods. It's like horrible human Garfield. I, I wish nothing but the worst for the person that drew this. I, I truly mean that. Also, there's a, there's a bit where a cave man says come and I, I thought that was funny this came out in 1984 and is the catalyst for a lot of weird garfield fan theories which i'll go into later because they make up a lot of the iceberg they made one of those like tv special movie things of the comic book four years later with, with some slight differences it doesn't open with god designing cats on a computer screen and arbitrarily giving them nine lives instead they write charming sequences like him living in ancient egypt as a as a literal slave owner which you know might be might be a little hard to swallow but i guess way harder to swallow from here on in boys because it's time for tier two this is the point where things begin to get a little bit spooky, if, if you know what I mean. In the 1989 Halloween special comic strip, Garfield realises that the world he inhabits is just a construct. Garfield has imagined his whole world that we perceive through the comic strips to combat the crippling loneliness he feels as he lives in an abandoned house. At the end, Garfield manages to reinforce his delusions before he snaps, but we know the truth. And that leads us to the next bit of our tier list, that if the Halloween story is canon, then Garfield is actually fucking dead. Everything we get about Garfield post that Halloween 1989 strip is just Garfield's life flashing before his eyes as he slowly deteriorates from malnourishment or, or dehydration or maybe just loneliness and, and a broken heart, which some would say is a worse fate. Alone in an old dilapidated building. But thankfully, this theory is completely busted. Jim Davis himself has said that this comic strip isn't canon. Just, just a one-off thing where he was, he was trying to freak people out but for some reason. That was, that was really fucked up, Jim. You really sent the willies up my spine. Now we have what this iceberg meme refers to as the Heathcliff controversy. Now, what's that? Was it some kind of horrible Garfield-related incident that killed hundreds of people? No, it's just it's just another Orange Cat newspaper strip. At first glance, yeah, it, look, it looks like a Garfield ripoff. And yeah, a, a titan, a behemoth like Garfield is bound to have a couple of, a couple of copycats. You get it? Cat, cut, cop, cats. But the real controversy of this is that Heathcliff was actually first, and, and, and by a couple of years at least. You see, Heathcliff is the underdog cat. Heathcliff has been fighting his whole life to get your attention. He's had a TV show, he tried to make a movie once, but you, you didn't you didn't even care, you didn't even heard of it. Who the fuck's out of the Heathcliff movie? But Heathcliff was first. So looking into this, I, I kind of at first expected there to be some kind of lawsuit or huge surge of support for Heathcliff. But to my knowledge, Jim Davis has, has never even mentioned Heathcliff. He, he, does he even know of Heathcliff's existence? Who knows? The Heathcliff writer has done some goofs about their similarity, but yeah, they, they, they mostly just keep to themselves. Diana's Piano is one of the animated shorts from the TV version of Garfield's Nine Lives. It, it sucks. It's either just stills or free FPS animations that hurt to look at. It's about how in one of Garfield's lives, he was a lady cat called Diana, named after Ardai, the people's princess. Diana loves, loves just chilling on the piano and listening to her owner play it. Her owner loves her, but also wants a husband or something. Eventually, Diana dies on the piano. The Nine Lives stuff as a whole is, is kind of weird and, and creepy at points because it's immensely overshadowed by the concept of death and, and the finality of it. Also, it seems to have like an older 
bigger target audience than, than Garfield normally does, which is, I, I don't know, I, I guess a bit odd. But Diana's Piano also feels like it has so little to do with Garfield that it just feels out of place even being a part of Garfield canon. And I honestly resent it for even trying to be. Next is Lyman. He's got a stupid name and a stupid moustache. It, it looks like creepy wooden teeth. He's written as John's only friend to give him someone to talk to, but when they realised that his only friend should be Garfield, Lyman was then removed, and, and, and he never returned. Square Root and Minus Garfield is a sort of parody website where people take existing Garfield comics and edit them to change the story. There's not much to it. It's, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. It, it do be funny at points, though. Garfield Scary Scavenger Hunt is one of those classic browser games you get back in the early 2000s where the whole meme was to was to just find stuff. It's a pretty simple game, pretty simple concept. Garfield needs to go around, find some sweet treats without, without getting too scared. There's a bit coming up in this video that is probably my favourite bit of Garfield trivia, so I'll, ju I'll just save talking about that for then. The final glacier drip on this tier of the iceberg is that John is a cartoonist and that that's his job, which honestly isn't a massive revelation necessarily, but it's a it's, it's kind of kind of a little cool factoid, it's something to throw out on the date with the with the Garfield girl. The Skywalker bloodline, the Windsor bloodline, the Garfield bloodline. These are my top three favourite bloodlines. Garfield at number one, obviously. That's what kicks off tier three. Who's Garfield's family? Do you know? I do. All of them. This is the sort of knowledge that actually makes you the talk of the local Garfield fan club. At this point, you're safe wearing a sweet Garfield hoodie. Because you definitely know Garfield better than your average mid-tier human who only casually consumes Garfield content. Garfield's mum is shown in Garfield's Nine Lives. One pint, which shows his first few seconds on earth. In the comic, we see Garfield being born in an Italian restaurant, which is which is why he likes lasagna. It all makes sense now. It's the only positive thing about his childhood, it seems. His mum says, "Welcome to the world, little fellow. I think I'll call you Garfield," which is a tragedy in of itself. Who call, who calls their child Garfield? She then tells him he has a lot to learn. Which I mean, yeah, he's. He's just been born, of course, he has a lot to learn, idiot. Garfield then proceeds to eat all the yummy lasagna and pasta, but get, gets booted from his home and dumped at a pet shop. When they did the TV adaptation of this, they decided to make Garfield's mum actually sad about this and give her a scene where she says goodbye to him, which definitely saves this uh, Garfield origin story. As without it, you feel that Garfield came from a, a family that, 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 that I just didn't give a shit about him. Adult Garfield gets reunited with his mum when in Garfield on the Town, a 1983 TV special, he goes back to the now run-down Italian restaurant he was born in, he finds his mum still there, now astray. She introduces Garfield to his other family members, including his grandfather, cousins, and brother. His brother is heavily implied to be a stoner, or, or an alcoholic, or both. His speech is slurred, his eyes are droopy, and when he flops into his box, you can hear the clinking of bottles. This is... I, I, I thought this was a children's cartoon. To be fair, these cats aren't living much of a, a life of luxury. They're all skinny, they need a cat on the lookout to look out for the violent cat gangs. That's when you know times are rough. Garfield's grandfather is, is a stern man cat who doesn't see Garfield as man cat enough and never gives him his approval. He gives Garfield's mum a look and she knows Garfield has to go. Similar to Garfield's birth, she doesn't really seem to care that much or even try and spend more time with her son. She just lets him get thrown out like any loving mother would. She tells Garfield that all the family he's ever known don't like him, which is very nice. If my mum told me that, I'd be like, thanks mum, but only because they envy him for his unlimited access to food and shelter, which they do not have. Essentially, it's a class thing. You feel bad for Garfield's family. You feel that they deserve the same basic essential things that Garfield has. It's only by pure chance that Garfield is so well set up. So they stay where they are. Garfield gets the palace and, and, that, and that's just the way it is. As you know, Arlene is the buff fantasy cat of Garfield's dreams. He definitely seems to care about her, and she's in the comics and, and TV shows sometimes. And I know what you're thinking, because the, the title of this one is Arlene is Astray. I, I know we're thinking the same thing. I got, I got, um, what's it, what's it, telekinesis. I got telekinesis. We're thinking the same thing. Arlene is real? Does she have a phone number I can call to see what she's doing on Wednesday? She does have a sort of mystery around her. We never see her owners or anything. This whole stray cat theory isn't so much a theory, but a 100% confirmed fact. Garfield's Judgment Day might sound like some intense religious rapture story with Garfield in it for some reason, but it's actually a picture book about a storm coming to Garfield's town. The story is written in a more traditional writing style as opposed to comic strip format, which is pretty rare for a Garfield story. It's in the story we get this bit about Arlene <coughs> in a dark and dirty 
Bertie Alley, Arlene approached her home. Arlene's home did not have a fence around it. Arlene's home did not have a yard, a tree, a flower. Arlene's home did not even have windows. Arlene lived in a box. She didn't have an owner. Arlene was astray. Arlene was ashamed of this fact. It was a secret she had kept for many years. This is honestly pretty heartbreaking. I mean, Arlene isn't my favourite cat in the world, but she is the longest in the Garfield verse, minus Garfield's mum, of course. It doesn't seem like she's happy living in her current condition, but I had hope, thinking over the course of this story, Arlene would find a home somewhere and have what Garfield has. When the storm hits, Garfield is told the truth about Arlene, and weirdly, we're not really told how Garfield feels about this, if he cares, if he's sad, if he judges her. Instead, he rushes to save her from, from, the, from the storm. The fact she's astray is completely ignored and, and just not mentioned again. It's at this point in the tier list where things begin to get real spooky. I'm serious, this is a warning. At this point, things are gonna get, they're gonna get pretty shocking. We're getting to the darker corners of Garfield's nine lives. Lab Animal tells the story of one of Garfield's past lives, where he was a laboratory test animal getting injected with weird serum and being kept in a cage. It's pretty sad since he's literally about to get dissected so the scientists can look at his in intestines to study the effect on his body after injecting him. Garfield, who in this is called GB19, but it's, it's still Garfield, hears about this and makes a hasty escape. He runs away for a bit and the artwork looks a lot like scary Vietnam footage. And, and then Garfield turns into a dog and, and gets away. So yeah, it's almost like a, a Garfield creepypasta. Because if you were Garfield, like put yourself in Garfield's shoes and read that story of yourself getting turned into a dog. I think that would be pretty scary for you. But Garfield gets even darker. There's this really horrible theory that John kidnapped Lyman and keeps him locked up in a basement. And I mean, John is a wet wipe. He would never hurt a fly. I, I don't want to believe it of John. But they do say it's always the ones you least expect. Apparently, the evidence is in this 2002 game from the official Garfield website, Garfield Scary Scavenger Hunt. And honestly, I think this might be my favorite bit of Garfield lore or, or whatever. In the game, when you go to explore the basement, you see the axed Garfield character chained up. Now, Lyman disappeared in 19. 83. Mysteriously, out of nowhere. This game was released in 2002 and I mean, it's an official Garfield game. So I'm just going to assume it's canon that John has had Lyman tied up in a basement for 19 years. Nermal's owner is the next one. You might remember Nermal as that little scrappy doo cat type character that Garfield is always trying to send to Abu Dhabi or somewhere like that. But why is he even there? Does John Cat sit him? Is, who is the owner? In the comic, John says that Nermal is his parents' cat, but that is that is 100% lies. And considering John's psychopathic personality, it's, it's unsurprising that nearly everything that comes out of his lying lips is complete bullshit. We never get shown or told who they are. Only the vague idea that Nermal is, is dropped off to them every now and then. And I, I don't blame whoever's dropping him off without explanation. Normal is like that friend's annoying little brother they just have to drag everywhere. Garfield Live is a proper official Garfield Live show, but it's kind of like a low-budget Shrek the Musical kind of kind of thing. It's not a proper live show or anything like that. It, like it's not in theaters or anything. It's one of those little shows they do in shopping centers for kids. But it's like it's like a proper Garfield thing. It's like licensed or whatever. For this video, I was obliged to watch the whole show. It's only it's less than 20 minutes long, so it weren't that bad. And as expected, it's, it's not a phenomenal piece of theater. If you go into watching <laughs> Garfield and Friends live show, expecting it to be anything more than a low-budget goofy show for kids, you're you're, bar you're barking up the wrong tree. The plot is that Garfield and Nermal fight over what music they want to listen to. Gripping, I know. Garfield wants Taylor Swift as in the lore. He's known to be an avid Swifty. And Nermal wants classical music because he's 80 years old. But they're cats, so I'm, I'm not really sure how they're able to turn the knob on the radio. John then invites Arlene over to be in charge. I would make a joke saying something like I'd let her be in charge of me, but this is a live show for kids, and that would be disgusting, so I'm not going to say that. Now, just to question the logic of Garfield and Friends life and poke holes in its, its flawless storytelling. How is John going to make a cat in charge of two other cats and a dog? How, how is he going to enforce that? How do, how do you even invite another cat over? She even rings the bell when she arrives. Oh good, she's here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter in the slice. It's a shopping centre theatre production for kids. I'm over it. I don't care. I already wasted my life watching it. I don't want to waste any more of it reliving the play explaining it to you. We all know Garfield is a fat bastard, but where on the scale of John feeding his cat copious amounts of lasagna is it animal abuse? At what point does this poor little guy's heart just burst after the copious amounts of processed cheese, fatty beef, laid upon sheets of pasta? There's lots of Garfield comments where we see him standing on scales or John alluding to his weight, but we can't actually see on the scales what that number is. But there is one comic strip which gives Garfield's exact weight. It shows Garfield attempting to eat 10 times his body weight in lasagna, which is said to be 270 pounds of lasagna. So that means Garfield's exact weight is 27 pounds. 
pounds, roughly the weight of two bowling balls. The average domestic house cat weighs around 10 pounds. So Garfield is definitely being abused by John and the RSPCA should remove him now. B Big Bob come, lol. And the beginning of tier four is ah oh, oh oh god that is that is disgusting I'm sick I'm sick of this I retreat to the Garfield verse to get away from this kind of depravity Jim Davis said what John drinks in this comic strip is a protein enriched drink formulated for a pregnant dog but I I I don't buy it you're bullshitting us Jim now after all that cum talk it's back to the scary. This is the sequel to Animal Lab called Primal Self. But now we're in like the legit Dark Garfield verse. This is this is where it gets really really scary. I know I said it got, it got spooky earlier, but no, this this is where this is where it gets really scary. Garfield, who in this life is a cat named Tigger, gets possessed with the spirit of his primal ancestral lion, and he sees all the blood his ancient ancestors are steeped in, and just kind of goes feral, slicing and dicing the old lady he lives with. Not very nice of him, really. At this point, it's kind of epic that a Garfield comic would get this dark. I rate it. I rate it highly. But I, I sleep with one eye open again. Now with this type of awareness on. Garfield, you could stand a chance with the rare Garfield girl. And to be honest, I just want to get straight to the point. Garfield girl, that, that's why I'm researching this. T to, to impress you. That and um, the ab revenue. So this theory is an interesting one. Odie, the classic idiot sidekick archetype, is actually the smartest person in the room, huh? Or, or at least he's smarter than he pretends to be. If you're familiar enough with the comic strips, the many, many years of them, you realise that Odie, Odie has, a, has an odd mean streak. This has led to occasions of Odie throwing Garfield through walls and dropping bowling balls on his head, all whilst playing the dumb act. What's even weirder is that in later strips, you see Odie reading War and Peace and listening to classical music. This is smart for a dog. He also solves a Sudoku puzzle that John couldn't. Now, once again, I will say, it is smart for a dog, especially for Odie, a stupid dog who presents the mental age of a baby. But it is not smart for a grown human man to be reading War and Peace and doing Sudoku. Sudoku, Sudaku, I don't know how you say I don't care. I mean, my attention span has been obliterated in recent years, so I wouldn't be able to read War and Peace, and I don't know what Sudoku is, so I wouldn't be able to do those things. But the average functioning adult human man probably would be able to. That, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, looking at this out of context, it is obviously just sort of like Jim Davis humor, I think. Just making jokes and doing the old switch a ruin subverting expectations. It's a funny punchline for the stupid guy to do something smart, right? Because if Odie was always so smart, why is he always letting Garfield push him around? What's that about? That's not intelligent alpha behavior. And if you're not alpha, how smart can you really be? Next, we have Lasagna Cat. Lasagna Cat is a, a weird YouTube show where some guys decided to commit their channel to remaking Garfield comic strips, but in, in live action with a surreal twist to it. They're strangely really well made and the production quality is definitely there. It's actually pretty brilliant. Honestly, the amount of content they have is mad and just the amount of theories there are on them can make its own video. They haven't released a video in over five years, which is heartbreaking. And the last video they made is, is four hours long and it's just mannequins going up to Garfield's house and, and saying how many people they've had sex with. Right up until the last seven minutes where it takes it a really dark and weird time. M most of their videos have that vibe. Garfield Caught in the Act is a Sega Genesis game from 1995 about Garfield getting sucked into a TV. Originally, it was meant to be twice as long and there are three missing levels, which at one point were playable through the Sega channel, which is like game streaming before it's cool. And because everyone was stupid back in 1995, no one thought to try and hack and download them and they have since been lost. And yes, I do blame everyone that was alive in 1995 for that. No one has any idea what the levels look like. It seems like there's only the titles of two of the levels out there, Bonehead Barbarian and Slobbin Hood. See, I, I do cry every day at the loss of extra Garfield content, but hey, as, as long as I got Garfield cut, I feel as though my Garfield gaming first is quenched. Everyone knows that Garfield hates Mondays. It's the world's favourite cat's most famous catchphrase. It embodies his entire character and it's part of the secret source why Garfield is so relatable and loved. But why does Garfield hate Mondays? The obvious answer is that most people hate Mondays. If you work a normal five day week, then Monday is your first day where you have to wake up early, put on your uncomfortable uniform and commute to a job you hate. The horrible pain of returning to an empty and unsatisfying place after experiencing that, that, that small taste of freedom. When Garfield says he hates Mondays, he, he's winking at you and saying, geez, don't, don't Mondays suck? And you blankly stare and think, yes, Garfield, you're right. Mondays are the worst. And things seem more bearable. You feel less alone as a result of that. But why 
would Garfield, a cat who is unemployed, hate Mondays? Well, there's four theories that might explain this. First theory, Garfield hates Mondays because John goes to work on Mondays and leaves Garfield alone after two days of him constantly being around. This theory is just 100% wrong. Remember, John is a cartoonist. That means he most likely works from home. Also, have you ever seen Garfield? He doesn't appreciate John in the slightest. John could die, and if he was somehow still being fed, it would take him a week to realize. The second theory has a bit more credibility. If you remember from before, Garfield was born in an Italian restaurant. It's, it's a local one, not a chain one. So chances are the restaurant would be closed on Mondays, as that is the day these types of restaurants are usually closed. So that would mean Garfield would have to eat leftovers on Monday. No, no fresh lasagna for the guy. The third theory on why Garfield hates Mondays is because President James A. Garfield was assassinated and then died on a Monday. But would Jim Davis have known this? Was Garfield even named after him? No, no to both of them. The final theory on why Garfield hates Mondays. Bad things just seem to happen to Garfield on Mondays. Throughout the comic strips, it seems like he has bad luck and the universe is just in spite of Garfield on Mondays. His alarm clock slaps him in the face. He gets trapped inside his window shutter and one time when he's talking about Mondays, a pie gets launched at his face. Or my my theory, my theory, fifth theory, it's, it's, it, he's, a, he's just trying to be relatable. I, I think it's that. It's a well-known fact that pizza is way easier to draw than lasagna. So Jim Davis was seriously considering making Garfield's favourite food, pizza. And let that sink in for a second. How different would the world be? Really think about that. Imagine Garfield going, mmm, I love pizza instead of, mmm, I love lasagna. It's just wrong! Now that's the kind of Garfield trivia that will really blow someone's mind. Next time you're eating pizza and you've got a, be a beautiful female opposite you, drop that little bit of trivia and she'll be all over you. Bill Murray plays Garfield in the Garfield movies. That's, that's almost dream casting. Who better to play the dry-witted and sarcastic cat than Bill Murray? In the cartoon, Lorenzo Music voices Garfield, and, and he, he sounds just like Bill Murray. In fact, Lorenzo Music played Bill Murray's character in the animated Ghostbusters show. Which, that, that, and that's, that's another bit on the iceberg, so th th there it is. Now you know. I'm, I'm not going to get into the live-action Garfield movies, as I've already watched both of them in one sitting and drank every time lasagna and, and Monday was said, which, which, was a, which was an awful idea. But we just got to keep him safe till Monday. I'm not doing it. Cheers, George. Fuck off! They're gonna mention it so many fucking times! I hate Monday. Ah! Fuck off! <laughs> no more Monday. Fuck, Fuck off! We're not fucking doing this! Uh, Mondays. Just bring me a <coughs> piping hot dish oh, of hell. lasagna. Oh, fuck off! Fuck off, Garfield! And it can't hurt lasagna. Fuck off! <laughs> Fuck off! We're preparing the roll lasagna. Oh, lasagna Did the Indians serve to the pilgrims? Lasagna. <laughs> ah! Stop the off Yo, it's lasagna, not shish kebab. Ah! Nothing. Television and lasagna. Ah! But I did always find it odd why Bill Murray decided to do these films. At the point of Bill's career when these films were made, he was making a lot, of, a lot of critically acclaimed films. He was in Lost in Translation, which he was nominated for an Oscar for. He was then in Coffee and Cigarettes, uh, then the Garfield movie, and then Wes Anderson's Life Aquatic with Steve's. Steve's. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce that. So the Garfield movie kind of sticks out a bit here. The truth is, Bill Murray was tricked. You see, tricked by his own lack of attention. The writer of the Garfield film is Joel Cohen notes the H in his second name. He wrote films such as Monster Mash, Money Talks, and, and Daddy Day Camp, but Bill Murray thought he had received a script written by Joel Cohen. Joel Cohen wrote classics like The Big Lebowski, Fargo, and No Country for Old Men. A Garfield film written by Joel Cohen would be sweet, Bill Murray likely thought to himself, and signed on without even finishing the script, or, or questioning why Joel Cohen would write a Garfield movie. But it did make bank at the box office, so Bill Murray signed on to make the sequel, showing that mistakes do sometimes result in big cash payouts like my birth. I talked a bit about Garfield's Judgment Day before when revealing the shocking poverty Arlene lives in every day, but before it was a picture book, it was a scrapped feature-length movie. For reasons that I don't fully understand, Jim Davis was really set on making a feature-length animated movie where Garfield's town gets destroyed by a tornado. Jim Davis wrote a lot of scripts and paid writers, artists, and musicians to work on the project. He pitched it to Fox and Disney, but he was told the idea was too dark. As for me, having read through the picture book of this story, I don't believe it would have been the magnum opus Jim Davis promised it would be, but it, 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 it probably would have been better than the live action movies. <laughs> A week at Garfield is next, and this is just another Garfield platformer that we, the West, never got a taste of. It was released on the Famicom in 1989. It's not got a mystery like missing levels or anything exciting like that. It's just like a slightly more trash-looking Garfield game than any other one. For me, personally, I'm alright with missing out on this one. After Garfield's scavenger hunt, I, I can't really play a Garfield game without, without feeling my heart go a little too much, you know? <laughs>
The final point on this level of the iceberg is more just sort of a fact. Garfield was originally going to be about John and, and Odie was going to be named Spot. The comic strip was going to focus on a loser man who had a cat, but Jim Davis realised that the cat was a more compelling and marketable character than a, a, a boring man. Odie's name was going to be Spot, but they realised that there was already a comic strip dog called Spot, so, so they called him Odie. It isn't, it isn't necessarily a mind-blowing fact. To be honest, I, I don't know why this one is so far down the iceberg. I don't know why it's further down the iceberg than the story about Garfield mauling an old lady, but hey, who, who am I to question the decision making of reddit user godfield all right, now we're at a great point in the iceberg. At this point, if you're here, you can probably make it to the director's board of the Garfield fan club. You no longer need to chase Garfield girls. They will come to you. Your knowledge is so vast. Your dedication considered so absolute. You're basically treated like a guru around certain Garfield circles. The first point on this list covers Jim Davis' greatest ever regret for his creation of Garfield, Zombie Garfield merch. The main thing with Garfield at the end of the day is the merch, all right? Not, not the stupid comics, not the dumb TV shows. It's the toys, the plushies, the clothes. That's what Jim Davis cares the most about. But the one thing he has never been able to let go of in his mind is the day he put out those, those licensed Zombie Garfield t-shirts. He felt it was merch that didn't further Garfield's character. He said that after doing the Zombie Garfield merch, he didn't have a warm, fuzzy feeling. And that makes be sad that a t-shirt took away Jim's warm and fuzzy feeling. Jim Davis was working on the Peanuts TV special in the 70s, and there he met Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts. Jim shared his frustration at trying to draw Garfield standing on two legs with the other illustrator. Charles explained that the reason why Garfield looked so odd standing up on two legs was because of his teeny tiny cat feet, and he drew Garfield standing up with huge human feet. This would be the first ever image of Garfield standing on two legs and the design stuck around. As for Charles himself, according to some biographies, the man hated the Garfield comics, as he felt that over-merchandising was poorly judged and thought humanity's love for such an egotistical and selfish character was a telling sign of society's change into individualism and capitalism. But all this is speculation, really. There's no, there's no direct quotes from the guy. He, he drew Garfield standing up. That's the main point. In every version of Garfield's Nine Lives, his eighth life is the one we see in the comic strips and TV shows. The one with Odie and John, where he hates Mondays and loves lasagna. Where Arlene is homeless and his mum is astray. Where every facet of life is just a flashback as Garfield dies of malnourishment in a home long abandoned by John and Odie. That life, that's his eighth one. Now this iceberg meme throws us a, a bit of a curveball here. Garfield's dad? I spent days reading through every Garfield comic looking for Garfield's dad. I watched all five seasons of the CGI Garfield show looking for a whisper in relation to the mythical father of an icon. But nothing, no image, no mention. When Garfield's born, there's no father figure. And Garfield never asks his mum about him either. I thought that this meme was just trying to catch you out by making you think there was a hidden bit of trivia or reference to Garfield's dad. But it, it's actually making a much larger statement. Garfield's father is completely absent from his life. This explains why Garfield is so cynical and untrusting, why he's so quick to jealousy and why he often makes fun of John. There's a deep emptiness in Garfield. This is why Garfield simultaneously pulls John in and pushes him away, sometimes showing deep affection and other times treating John like a dick. Scream and Binky were short reoccurring sketches which appeared on Garfield and Friends. They were all under a minute and featuring the same setup and punchline each time. The setup is that we get introduced to some characters in a setting where they have to concentrate and not slip up. Then a creepy obnoxious Pennywise looking clown named Binky will come crashing in and start speaking in a loud and off-putting tone that completely destabilizes the environment and pretty much fucks up everyone's day. When Garfield and Friends was released on DVD, four of these shorts were missing. Two were restored but the other two have still not been found. And every day I think about the missing two minutes of Garfield content and in desperation try to imagine my own screaming with Binky segments to fill the fill the huge hole in my arteries. Okay, now we've reached the tier where if you keep watching and you get the rest of this knowledge, the Garfield fan club won't want you in anymore. Those Garfield girlfriends you work so hard to acquire, they will run away from you in fear. Why? Because you will officially be weird. If you work them into conversation and you try and share some of these things with people, they will legitimately want nothing to do with you. I know this because it's happened to me through the process of making this video, so I've experienced the highs and lows of, of Garfield fandom. At first, I was just a youngling, naive and silly. But as I went deeper, I rose up the ranks until I had it all. I flew too close to the sun. I kept sinking deeper, meaning giving more of myself up. Now I am Garfield, and Garfield is me, and since Garfield doesn't exist, I am no one. 
This is the nightmare fuel that Garfield has managed to produce in its time on this earth. There's for some reason a remake of Garfield's Nine Lives called Garfield Volume 9. However, this comic had its own version of Lab Animal, in which basically the same story happens, but instead of becoming a dog, Garfield becomes uh, a, a roided out, massively dench Garfield. It's pretty much the same as the other comic until we reach this point where for some reason, once Garfield shrinks back down, the science assistant decides to tell the doctor nothing happened. So the doctor doubles his dose and then Garfield goes feral and, and kills the doctor doing evil experiments. So just to be clear, that puts us at at least two murders that are canonically confirmed in Garfield. Garfield's third life in Garfield, his nine lives in the TV special and his seventh in the comic book is shown to us as a strange and almost magical place. It's, it's all trippy and Garfield is seen with a young girl called Chloe. The garden is made by Chloe's uncle Todd. He isn't seen in this but only gives them one instruction. Do not open the crystal box on a checkered toadstool. After much tension, they resist the temptation and live happily in the garden forever and ever. It's like, it's like the Adam and Eve Garden of Eden Bible story, except they don't eat the apple and live in Eden forever. I don't know if this iceberg meme is actually stating that the story does take place in the biblical Eden or if it's just saying it's like the Garden of Eden. But anyway, it's not the actual Garden of Eden because there's a train in it and God never created trains. They were created by man. With all this talk about Garfield hits nine lives, you're probably wondering how it ends. Does the comic end with Garfield running out of nine lives and, and, and dying forever? Well, no, it ends with Garfield asking for another crack at it, and he is he is given nine lives to, to start all over again. This means that Garfield doesn't have nine lives, he in fact has 18. As for the other nine lives, we've never seen them, and they remain a mystery. I lie awake at night thinking about what could have occurred during them. For now, we don't know if Jim Davis is looking for some kind of young heir to write the continuation of this story, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm I'm open to it. Okay, so by now we all know that there are three Garfield Nine Lives media out there in the Garfield verse. There's the original comic, the TV special, and then the comic remake. But all of these stipulate different lives and alternatives for that canon. Only one can be legit, right? But what if I was to tell you that all three are canon? Garfield has three splitting timelines, and all of them converge on his eighth life where he's the normal Garfield we all know and love. I'm gonna hold my hands up. I've been wrong when saying we're talking about a Garfield verse. This is a Garfield multiverse. There's also the live action movies which sit outside these splitting timelines and live in a different Garfield verse altogether. So there are at least four Garfield verses. <laughs> Today I'll Watch You is a creepy fan comic from the depths of Square Root of Minus Garfield. This comic entitled Today I Watch You has Garfield say that line and then each panel shows Garfield fucked up in a different way. Top right being most uncomfortable. In reality it was just a Garfield fan messing around with their first Photoshop trying out different filters. But the unsettling nature of Today I Watch You has allowed it to mark its way into the consciousness of the internet and to be fair it is pretty creepy. Like if you look at it for too long it does make you uncomfortable. This isn't a weird theory, but it's specific. You have to watch the Nine Lives TV animated version. Now, in the comics, Garfield gets his Nine Lives reset, but it's sort of vague how that gets decided. But in this version, Odie and Garfield just straight up meet God. God looks a bit like Rasputin and is a bit dumb as Garfield manages to trick him into giving him all his Nine Lives back by convincing him that in his first one, he died unfairly. And he also convinced God that Odie's a cat as well. I'm pretty sure if you're God and you know you created all the animals on the earth, you know the difference between a cat and a dog and to present him otherwise is blasphemous and, and an act of lucifer This theory is it, the big brain Garfield genius test. If Garfield tricked God once, who's to say he couldn't do it again? The back and forth dialogue with Garfield and God feels as though it's casual, almost rehearsed. Who's to say this is even the first time God has given Garfield his nine lives back? Who's to say that Garfield isn't destined to continue this forever? He can't die, he's worth a billion. No matter what happens to him in his lives, by the time he gets to his ninth, there's always a way to restart again. Because at the core of it, at the bottom of that orange cup, you learn that's what Garfield is always about. Lasting, not dying, being the dead horse you can't stop kicking. Garfield has existed for over 40 years, and if that came to a halt, it would stop Jim Davis's entire empire. So Garfield cannot die. He must keep chugging along, but they'll definitely take him to some weird places to keep that heart beating.